This week, we talk with Jillian Fitzpatrick and Justin Donnelly, who have contributed to the Moon Gallery, which will become the first off-planet art gallery when it is launched to the International Space Station this week. An art gallery on the space station? Yes, you heard us correct. We're going to find out all about it and get you up to date with all the latest news from the world of space. Please let us know what you think of what we're doing. You can contact us at Space and Things 1 on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Facebook. Or drop us a message on the contact form on our website, spaceandthingspodcast.com. But right now, please enjoy episode 77 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. You're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles. And welcome to episode 77 of our podcast. Emily, we're in the middle of a big storm over here. Oh, no. Okay. Storm Dudley. Great name. Uh, Dudley. Dudley. Like, <laughs> Dudley Moore. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So if we hear any whistling, it's uh, it's the wind ravaging against the, the side of my flat. So that's what that's all about. Uh, no drama. Hopefully it will all still be standing in the morning, but that's just what's going on. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm not too bad. Not too bad. Hey, so you wrote a wonderful article this week, which I just wanted to bring up before we got going. Absolutely loved this one. Uh, the deep space EVA that shouldn't have happened. Obviously, I knew about the story, but you researched this so well and presented it so well. So uh, yeah, t- tell us a bit more about that. Many of you have probably know if you are into space history that... Uh Jim Irwin suffered from heart problems not too long, really, after he came back from his uh, Apollo 15 mission. So I always wanted to dig a little more into that. I always felt that uh, Warden and Scott, had they been aware of what was going on maybe with him, you know, while the mission was happening, I think they would have acted differently, yeah. honestly. Like, I have always felt that, but I but they didn't have that piece of information. So I really wanted to delve into that. I'm one of those people, I love to see perspectives of things from like every person that was there. So I wanted to get each of like the men's voices to say, okay, this is what was happening at this particular time. Like I I love that kind of, I love reading those kind of stories. So that's what I wanted to do. So yeah, I just put it together. and, And plus I'd never seen anything. I wanted to write something that was maybe a little under more understandable for non-medical people I, I wanted to do it for a long time and I, I was rereading Al Warden's new book and he was talking about Jim Irwin and I was like suddenly a light bulb came on I was like why not just do it now so I Absolutely. passed it by a, a few uh, friends of mine so they could sort of you know see if it was good or not because I really wanted to nail it but um a lot of people have read it and I'm really proud of how it turned out and I hope it contributed something I don't know if it's brand new but something that the space history canon sort of needed out there. I agree. I think I think it does. Well, I haven't read anything that covers it quite like you've done it. I think we should do a, a little episode on that at some point. I think it was such a good topic. Yeah, I'd love to talk more about it. I, I It's really interesting. And I loved wrapping it up with Scott Warden and Irwin all sort of talking about it, you know, yeah. because uh, that to me was intriguing mm-hmm. to get each piece from that. Absolutely. Anyway, it's time for us to crack on with this week's interview. And uh, we're joined by artist Gillian Fitzpatrick and academic Justin Donnelly from Dublin in Ireland. Uh, The pair have just contributed a piece of art for a gallery called Moon Gallery Test Flight, which is being launched to the International Space Station this week on board a Cygnus supply ship. The exhibition features 64 different artworks from a group of international artists, which are integrated onto an 8x8 centimeter grid. And our guests have contributed a piece called Light Gold to Airy Thinness Beat, which is a tiny golden ship and derives from the John Donne poem, A Valediction, Forbidden Morning, which evokes the images of a solar sail unfurling to travel across the vast distances between planets. The gallery will remain on board for 10 months before returning to Earth. Uh, This whole thing is really blowing my mind a little bit, so let's start with this interview. And from every window, we have a really spectacular view of the Earth, and as, as well as the, uh, what surprised me, the real, real blackness of space. I don't think I've ever seen black as it is out here. 
Welcome, Gillian and Justin. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so let's let's get back to the beginning. What brought an artist and a physicist together to get involved with Moon Gallery? Well, Justin and I have been friends for a good few years now, but and we've kind of collaborated on previous things in in the past. Justin, even though he's a physicist, is very interested in art, particularly film and. I have had a long history of, in my own work, being interested in sp the history of space exploration, particularly. So we've kind of worked together on a couple of projects in the past. I did um, a uh, commemoration, I suppose, a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing in 2019. And Justin kind of helped me out with that. But he kind of nice. stayed in the background a bit with that. But when this came along, this amazing opportunity came along, we decided to make it like a proper uh, official collaboration. And um, what exactly is Moon Gallery to our listeners who perhaps have not heard of it before? It's based in Amsterdam and it is an organisation that is interested in kind of fostering cooperation between different disciplines like art and science and technology. It's partnered with the European Space Agency and Nanorex are the main partners for this particular particular project. They have designed the container for the gallery. Wow, nice. And another one of their partners is uh, the International Lunar Exploration Working Group. And the director of that, Dr. Bernard Fong, is also the director of Euromoon Mars. And their areas of research involve uh, looking towards, you know, a future of people living on other planets and, you know, simulating those situations and doing experiments and research around that. So that's the kind of background of what the, the Moon Gallery came out of. The, this exhibition is called the Moon Gallery Test Flight. Ultimately, the Moon Gallery wants to get a gallery on the moon sometime when we get back there again, if we get back there again in the next few years. All right. So tell us more about the uh, piece you are contributing to the gallery. There was an open call for anyone who wanted to submit any ideas. And so we, we thought about that. And really, the inspiration for it came from the restrictions. And a lot of good art comes from restrictions. And the physical parameters were very restrictive. Every piece of art has to fit into one cubic centimeter. So that got me thinking immediately about either it's going to be, have, to be, have to be a very small object or one that folds up into a small space um so something folding up and then space made me think immediately of solar sails nice uh, yeah. which unfolds and unfurl and my image of solar sails was that they were gold uh, i didn't know too much about solar sails mm -hmm. at the time until i looked at more into it um, and that immediately sprung um, another thought which was a line from a john dunn poem john dunn was a metaphysical poet from elizabethan times in England. And his poem is a poem he wrote to his wife before he left England to go to Europe, which was a very big trip back then. And it's called A Valediction Forbidding Morning. And one line in it, he talks about what will happen with their love and their connection. And he says, our love will endure not a breach, but an expansion, like gold to airy thinness beat. And that phrase stuck with me for decades. It's such a powerful phrase. This image of if gold can be beaten and spun out into a very long thread and a connection. It's a beautiful connection that can uh, span huge distances. And I thought that's what solar sails can do. The pressure of sunlight on a sail, maybe that will connect lovers on separate planets one day. Oh, nice. and so our piece is basically a, a tiny little ship with sails unfurling that can fit into one cubic centimeter. And it's been um, covered in gold leaf. Wow. It's really quite something this, isn't it? There's 64 different pieces of art being displayed within the eight by eight centimeter display. Was it challenging creating something so small that also told a story? You've just explained what your piece is, but what were the technical challenges involved? I, I've done a lot of sculptural work over the years, but I've never remotely done anything that small. So it took a few goes to get anything that was kind of working properly. And I had to kind of look at the, you know, reconsider the tools I was using and get a considerably better magnification for my <laughs> workspace. <laughs> and um, 
once we had the kind of the ideas locked down and we decided it was going to be a ship, it was then just a matter, I guess, of refining the physical object until we got it looking just right. Yeah. I, I mean, the first one we did was really, really rough. I mean, I thought I was doing great and I'd done this little thing and it was looking fantastic. And then we put it on a macro lens and it looked just dreadful <laughs> so i kind of <laughs> then i started refining the process and it got better and better and then we got we got it down to these really kind of you know refined little little objects you know most of the pieces in the gallery tend to be more abstract ours is quite representative of what it is um but we, it became a little bit more abstract and more refined and it turned into something that looks like a medieval cog which is an old uh, sailing ship from about 500 years ago. And just a brief follow-up, did you have any communication or connection with any of the other artists that were participating in this to get any feedback or exchange ideas on how to do this? That's one of the really sort of more strange aspects of this, I suppose, partly due to COVID and also partly due to the fact that the participating artists are from all over the world. We're the only uh, artists in, in the gallery that are based in Ireland. So we've actually not met anybody in person and the kind of meetings we've had have been more like kind of group zoom meetings where we'd be talking about kind of logistical things um i suppose some of the group are based around kind of amsterdam and the netherlands so they know each other and some of them are obviously friends and things like that but like for us it's it's been something that we've kind of had to work out ourselves so like we went through things of how we would place it in the boat and making it maybe a millimeter smaller or a millimeter wider or, or thinner and Gillian uh, tends to like a sort of Japanese aesthetic <laughs> kind of squat huge looking and I wanted a more sort of Viking longboat so we compromised somewhere in between that. but we were having arguments over one millimeter we were going mad really yeah. basically we were going split mad. the difference of one point between <laughs> 1.3 and 1.1 1. 1 millimeter yeah. uh, centimeters yeah. in the end of the story of my life <laughs> <laughs> but it was also it was also down to surviving the journey you know it's a lovely mm -hmm. romantic idea to think of a little boat and it's in it's in microgravity and it's floating away there and then there's also the reality that it's going to go up in a rocket so we think it will be okay but we're not 100% sure. <laughs> so well, there's a yeah. little bit of jeopardy. It can move around. There's a little bit of wiggle room, uh, which means it could behave interestingly in microgravity. Maybe it'll flip over. Maybe it'll turn mm. because, um, yeah. So, and we, we had two basic, I guess, um, principles that we worked on, which is one that it would be handmade, mm. that it wouldn't, um, and it would be rough and it would have human qualities to it. Mm. And that's okay. It would have flaws. And secondly, that it could be, it might not survive the journey, which we think is kind of beautiful too, mm. because yeah. that connection, you know, is is fragile too. Mm. So we, we'll see what happens. It's, it's an experiment, actually. Mm. Yeah, that's such a beautiful idea. I mean, it, there's part of me that thinks, wouldn't it be wonderful if it doesn't survive or something does break off and then that adds, it makes the art completely different to what you intended, yeah. which... Well, yeah, I'm going to say this because Gillian's sick of hearing this, but... If that happens, I have this idea. There was an old constellation called Argo, which was the ship, when the sky was a bit of a mess. In 1930, mm. the International Astronomical Union, as you know, brought it down to 88 constellations, and they, they broke Argo into the ship, into the Carina, the keel, Pupis, the stern, and Vela, the sail. So even if that happens, then we're covered. <laughs> So it's determined that. to make to bring every possibility yeah. into the artwork. Whatever happens, we we, we meant it. <laughs> That's awesome, amazing. So, what are the plans for the gallery once it's um, on board the ISS? Well, it's going up on Saturday the nineteenth, and it'll take about thirty hours to reach the space station. And I think we just today found out that it's going to be housed in the Col Columbia, Columbus, uh, Columbus, Columbus, Columbus module, the European module. And um, I'm hoping that somebody will bring it to the cupola and have a nice photo opportunity there. Mm. Very nice place to have a, an, an opening or a, a <laughs> opening of the gallery. And also, I mean, obviously, the, the audience for this is going to be the astronauts, but also there is a camera set up in the in the base of the of the display, which will take a photograph. I think it's going to transmit a photo every week so nice. people will be able to keep an eye because obviously some things will be more you know will move around more or possibly change more over the course of the over the course of time so so people will be able to be able to see it i'm absolutely loving this what is going to happen to the piece when um it returns back to earth 
Um, that stays the property of the Moon Gallery. Mm. And we actually made three pieces. There should be three sets. One will go up. One is a backup, much like they did with the Apollo missions. What the Moon Gallery does is both as in terms of looking for partners in terms of fundraising and raising information about this. They've been they've been going to various, you know, science and art fairs and uh, space expositions and things like that. They've been touring versions of it and I presume they will also tour with the with the actual with a copy of the actual one that's gone up as well. Oh, nice. And I guess with, with so many things, there will be plenty of people questioning this kind of activity and the costs involved in getting the gallery to the space station. So what would you say to those people and what do you feel is the significance of art in space? Oh, it's huge. Mm. It's, it's, um, I've, I've never separated them, to be honest, except when, when necessary. But I, I, it's maybe it's just the way my mind works. But those are the two wings that have kept civilization aloft. You know, we need art and we need science. Mm. Um, and I don't think we, we can or should just send a part of us up there. Mm. Um, and I think to get people on board, it's hugely important. When I talk about not having separation, like I remember reading Arthur C. Clarke stories growing up and he would write fiction based on very hard facts and he would write nonfiction and he would use poetry. So he would talk about the hyperfine transition in the hydrogen atom and how that emitted electromagnetism at 21 centimetres. And that causes the whole galactic disk to glow a little bit. And he said at the end of that scientific description, he said, this is the song of the hydrogen atom. Nice. And that's poetry. And if we sold mm. science like that more, we'd have everybody mm. on board. You know, if you're thinking about space and space exploration, it's a lot to kind of take in things of like scale and distance and strange kind of, you know, alien environments and um, it, it, it's awe-inspiring, but it could be also quite overwhelming. And, you know, I think in tandem with the like the scientific facts, I think art helps people get a kind of emotional or psychological understanding of us and their relationship to us and also how that changes their relationship to being on Earth and their understanding of what it is to live here, you know? A lot of the space exploration is accidentally art. I think going mm. to the moon you could consider as being one of the greatest art performances ever. You've got Apollo, which okay, he was the god of almost everything, but he was the god of the sun. <laughs> so you've got the sun touching the moon. You've got this symbol of the conscious mind coming in contact with the unconscious, mm -hmm. with the moon. So you have all those kinds of beautiful resonances. Mm -hmm. um, you've got that picture, I think it was Charlie Duke, of the family photo on the moon, that square picture. That's my favorite moon picture, I think, because... It, you've got this little square of color, this little family on this uh, gray moon, and it's left there, and it's haunting. And um, I think those things, you don't even have to sell that. You just show people that, and it, it, everyone would, would get on board. And we have the International Space Station. There's a huge amount of cooperation there. So they're actually getting on great. It could act as a United Nations in space. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. There has been a lot of talk of artists going to space over the last couple of years and we've really just started to see it happen we for example with nicole stott she's obviously she's an astronaut but she's been to the iss and she's painted on board the iss and dr cyan proctor um also created watercolors in space and there's definitely other space artists as well people who've done uh paintings and drawings of space uh, whether they're astronauts or just the uh, civilian i say civilians i mean non-astronauts but what are your thoughts of just sending standalone artists to space just to let them create i think that i think that would be amazing obviously <laughs> yeah i think that would be a great idea i mean it's such a rich area as you're talking about like the astronauts who've made art in space and then there's so many people who've like sent stuff into space put stuff onto the international space station or even like you know converted weather balloons to send them up into the you know right to the edge of space and do kind of take photographs and make sound recordings and things like that i think it would be an amazing an amazing opportunity and i think you see a lot of cross fertilization of ideas for example solar sails um, they used origami to mm. fold the sail mm. up and to make it unfold really efficiently so mm. you're using ancient paper folding techniques mm. in literally in space and so they they might be able to look at problems in a way that scientists don't and yeah. that's always good and, and vice versa mm. and that's given me one more question which is what lesson have you learned uh, from this whole experience that you're going to take forward in in your life <laughs> anything can happen <laughs> um, yeah. 
this weekend we're going to watch a thing we made go into space to the, the, the most incredible construction that's ever been placed yeah. in space. And it's been surreal the last um, six months or so. Yeah, it, it has. It's um, been it's been a great experience, but it's really been really unusual. And I suppose coming out of COVID and then this kind of happened, we literally have had moments where we're going, that's happening, isn't it? I mean, we haven't gone <laughs> mad. It is really happening. Yeah. Particularly when we're working on our own, you can start, yeah. start to doubt. Cause we, really? You <laughs> can't say this to people. So, did I really say that? Um, yeah, but infinite possibilities. That's, yeah. That would be my takeaway. Yeah. Because one day this was nothing, and then the next yeah. day we were doing this. So you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, and it, it's been great in that, like in the last few weeks, because I've been spreading word. Like some people are going to join us to to watch the launch, and then I've been telling other people that they can watch the launch online. And there's just been this incredible like buzz of positivity, and oh my god, that's so cool! And, you know, and it's just it's just been great. I think it's been it's just been a real kind of lifting people's spirits, and you know, it, it, it's been it's been amazing. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I can't wait to watch the launch myself. On uh, I'll probably watch it streaming, but I that'll be really cool. I'll be like, I know people who had something on that. That's really yeah, cool. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This is the kind of story we always wanted to do on the podcast. So uh, something different, something a little bit different. And I, for one, can't wait to see uh, your little piece of art floating around up there. Me, right. me neither. Me too. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Thanks it's so been much. great. The door's opening now, and it's pretty incredible. That was really cool. I can't wait to watch that launch. Um, it's happening on my birthday, which is really... Oh, nice. So I get some candles on my birthday, which is really exciting. I don't know if I've ever had nice. a launch on my birthday or if I ever watched one, but I can't wait because that'll be exciting because I'm like, oh, I know a payload that's going up. Well, I don't know if it's a payload. The word payload is so cold sounding. Like Absolutely It's is. art. It's art. Yeah. And it's being launched uh, from Virginia and Wallops Island Flight Facility uh, on a Cygnus spacecraft, um, Northrop Grumman Cygnus spacecraft, named after the British American climate scientist Pierce Sellers, who had three flights to the International Space Station. He unfortunately passed away in 2016 uh, at the age of 61. Um, after a battle with pancreatic cancer. I love it when uh, Northrop Grumman do this and they name the Cygnus spacecraft after astronauts who have died. I think it's a really wonderful tribute to astronauts of the past. Yeah, it's, I don't know, this is completely off topic, but a few years ago I got a, a, a tour of Northrop Grumman and uh, I couldn't take pictures in there because they had a lot of, uh, we'll just put it, uh, uh, Bad Bobby type payloads in there, you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> ones that, yeah, ones that take pictures of things that we're not supposed to talk about type of stuff. But yeah. um, the uh, USS John Young was being built. The, the, oh, nice. Yes. And, I, and I, I remember I saw my reflection in it and it wasn't called the John Young yet. But I, I found out like a few, you know, like a month later. Yeah. The USS John Young. And I'm like, that is so cool. I got to see it built. Like, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. that's so cool. But yeah, this is so exciting. And I'm just really excited for them. Yeah, I, I think this is a really awesome project and I really hope, you know, like we discussed in the interview, I, I would love to see standalone, maybe even just non-scientist artists like send Don Davis up there. We've had astronauts who've painted who've gone to space and that's awesome. And I'm not taking away from that, but I want to see I would love to see like a poet or an art, like a, you know, somebody who that's just what they do and sort of their interpretation of, you know, what they've seen, because the space environment I'd like to think, I'm hoping, to, to, that it will become part of our general consciousness eventually. So that would be cool. Yeah. And the other thing is, like Justin said, artists think differently. They will come up with different solutions to problems because of that. Yes. Even if you think about this project that, that they've made, Gillian was saying she had to change how she tooled things because they're doing something so small and stuff like that. Well... An artist is going to have to make the same adjustments in space. And, you know, Nicole talked about that when she was on our podcast about how she had to change her method of doing a watercolor because of zero gravity and the way she had to approach it. Well, as a result of that, we're going to learn things. And, and, and it may not be obvious what we're learning, but it will have a use and will have a use of, in, in terms of telling stories and how we communicate and so on and so forth. It's all good to me. And 
I found that whole interview to be really quite inspiring. And I'm just really excited by this whole project. And I think you could probably tell in that in the sound of my voice. Yeah, I love the uh, quote by John Donne that they used oh, as well. I love amazing. that. That's so beautiful because I've read a little bit of his work, but I forgot I forgot about that. Yeah. That's really a beautiful like way way to put it, you know, sort of a this golden tether that connects people, you know, and I, I love that. And I, I do view space as being something like that, even though yeah. it's very vast. You know, I, I do view it as a connector in a very, you know, sort of a surreal way, I guess. And I, I loved how Justin said about the idea that the, the connection in future may be an actual golden sow that, that exists between two lovers and different planets. Could you imagine? Yeah. Could you imagine? Anyway, this is uh, this has been wonderful. And, and as always, if you're one of our Patreon subscribers, you can watch the full unedited video of our interview with Gillian and Justin in our members area. If you're not a member, please consider joining us at patreon.com forward slash space and things. Uh, because you'll find out all about what guests we've got coming up. And next week, we've got a banger. We've got an incredible guest next week. I'm very excited. Actually, the next two weeks. The next two weeks are we've so We've got exciting. a lot of bangers coming oh. up. We got a lot oh. of we got a lot of good ones coming up. Yeah, we really do. And our patrons can submit questions as well, which is always great. So if you would like to know more about the Moon Gallery or about Justin and Jillian, then check the show notes, which you should be able to find within your podcast provider, or just head to our website spaceandthingspodcast.com and all the links you need will be right there. Discovery Houston, 20 seconds to LOS Tedris. Roger, nice to be in orbit. And so on to this week's news stories. There have been three successful launches since we last recorded, one from French Guiana, one from India, and one from Kazakhstan. And full details of those with videos will be in the show notes as well. But unfortunately, there was one failure. Now, we mentioned this last week, Astra were attempting their first orbital launch from Kennedy Space Center with their Rocket 3. Unfortunately, the second stage spun out of control due to a fairing separation issue, which means the four CubeSats, which it was hoping to place into orbit, have unfortunately been lost. It was their fourth launch attempt of this rocket. So they've still got a long way to go, but hopefully there's a lot that they can learn from this launch. Yeah, no cha-cha slide this time, though. Which no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't make fun of that. Seriously, space space flight is difficult, and um, I, I have all hopes that Astro will make it the next time. I, I don't... Certainly, if I built a rocket, I, I, it's not going to go right <laughs> probably the first 10 times. So, yeah, yeah <laughs> it's not easy. So, also, let's clear some things up from last week. Uh, it turns out that the rocket, which is about to hit the moon, well... It actually isn't a SpaceX Falcon 9, but it is, it is a Chinese Long March launcher, and it's due to hit the moon on March 4th. A group of students from the University of Arizona analyzed the data and corrected the earlier mistake from others who tracked the items in the sky. The plot thickens on this story, which really uh, isn't that big of a story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yep. While SpaceX aren't about to crash a rocket into the moon, <laughs> they have been in the news for a fair few other reasons this last week. So firstly, last Thursday, 10th of February, Elon Musk gave a press conference standing in front of the fully stacked Starship rocket on its new launch tower at the company's Starbase in South Texas. He had some updates about the new Raptor engines, which look a lot more streamlined and efficient, and gave information on the longer-term plans for Starship and the company's plan to set up a city on Mars. He believes that each Starship rocket will be capable of performing up to three launches a day, and that the launch capacity of one Starship rocket in a year will therefore be more than the mass of everything that's already been launched into space, which is absolutely crazy stuff. Uh, there was also some new animation of how it's all going to work and how the first stage is going to be caught by this launch tower. Uh, and he indicated that they expect the first orbital flight to take place before the end of this year. Uh, while a lot of all of this seems so unbelievable, when you look at what SpaceX have achieved so far, it's quite possible they may actually make some of this work, which would be quite something. As for the press conference, uh, I'm going to put my personal opinion all over this right now. I wish someone would talk Elon Musk into using a teleprompter, especially for these kind of big presentations, because I found it quite difficult to follow him in places, and often he seems more bothered about trying to get a cheap laugh than actually informing people on what he's supposed to be doing. And in the process, he gets lost into where he is. He's not a comedian, and he's not a public performer. Uh, he's great at what he does, but he's not either of those things. So that just takes you away from what 
he's actually trying to achieve with what he's talking about. And do you know what happened? I nearly fell asleep. <laughs> Which, given the audacity of these plans, it should not have been the case. Anyway, that's just my own thoughts thrown in at the end of that news story there. Here's where I get destroyed by every Elon Musk fan <laughs> on the internet and Twitter. Hey guys, Twitter guys on who are going to pair me up. How you doing? <laughs> I think his fans love it when he does like the dad jokes and stuff like that. So I think that's why he does it because he knows people are going to go nuts. Oh, you know, on Twitter and stuff like that. I think that's why he does it. But I agree. You know, it's kind of distracting, you know, and I, he, I don't think he needs that personally. You know, that's just how I feel. He could put jokes in a presentation that can cater to his audience if he wants to. But the way he tries to do them so unscripted is if he knows how to ad lib comedy it's just cringe. Yeah, it, come on, I agree. Like, that's not your profession. That takes years of experience of being on stage and knowing how to do that. Yeah, uh, and he just stumbles around. And, and and Emily, let's be honest, you and I stumble around on this sometimes. Yeah, we do. But the difference is, we know that this can be edited. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. when we do stumble around it, that's fine. We're not doing these live, knowing that. Everything has to be perfect and that lots of people are hanging on our word to be informed about this incredible new thing. Yeah. So I don't know. It just doesn't fill you with confidence when you see someone bumbling their way through a, a press conference like that. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I I hate admitting this. And like I said, Elon's fans are going to go after me, but I had to turn it off. To be fair... What you get from me and Dave, it, it is edited. We stumble a lot. I've probably stumbled 3,000 times already during this episode. So, you know, we're not perfect <laughs> yeah. by any means. In the same vein, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. I, I feel like it needed some polishing or, or something. Uh, SpaceX, we're also in the news because uh, 40 of the 49 Starlink satellites launched on February 3rd have been lost after a geomagnetic storm, which hit the day after. The storm increased the density of the Earth's atmosphere slightly, which increased drag on the satellites, which is why Skylab came down. Hey, uh, I got it in. There which, it is. There it is. <laughs> which meant they re-entered the Earth's atmosphere before they were able to perform maneuvers, which would, would have raised their orbit to a safe height. A storm like this occurs due to solar winds, which cause the Earth's upper atmosphere to warm up to increase the atmospheric density a bit, which causes drag. This storm was caused by a sun eruption on January 30th, which sent a wave of charged particles towards Earth, which arrived on February 2nd. So definitely something to think about in the, in the future when we're launching these satellites. We got one more SpaceX story, and this is one I absolutely love. Uh, I'm sure you remember the Inspiration4 mission from last year. One of my favorite things that happened last year, if not my favorite thing that happened last year. Well, the commander of that mission, Jared Isaacman, is at it again. Uh, this time, he's bankrolled a series of three SpaceX launches designed to rapidly advance human space flight capabilities while also raising funds and awareness for causes on Earth. He's calling it the Polaris program, and the first mission will take place on a Dragon capsule as soon as November or December this year, and will end with the first crewed launch of a Starship rocket, which is pretty crazy. Jesus. <laughs> The first mission is called Polaris Dawn and will once again feature Isaacman as the mission commander, along with three crewmates, pilot Scott Poteet, who was the mission director for Inspiration4, mission specialist Sarah Gillis, who oversees SpaceX astronaut training program, uh, and she was also very visible uh, in the documentary on Netflix about Inspiration4, and finally, medical officer Anna Minon who uh, manages the development of SpaceX's crew operations while also serving in the company's mission control. She's also the wife of Anil Minon, who has just been named in NASA's latest astronaut class, and she will fly in space before him, which is pretty neat. Love that. That is cool. The plan for this mission is to try and achieve the highest ever orbital flight ever flown, the highest apogee, beating the record which still stands from Gemini 11 in 1966. Go Navy. Yes, go Navy, right? <laughs> yes. It is also the intention of two of the crew to perform spacewalks, which will be the first commercial extravehicular activities, and SpaceX are designing all new suits for this. New suits, yes. Yes, this is going to be cool. <laughs> the missions will also aim to benefit the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital to try and improve global survival rates for childhood cancer. So that's... That's really cool. I think Mike Makowski said this on Twitter, our, our last week's guest said this on Twitter that, you know, this might be the Gemini to Artemis' Apollo. 
<laughs> wow. Yeah. Isn't that cool? That is cool. I hate admitting this because I honestly think we're quite fortunate to live in the times that we live in. But I always used to be like, man, I didn't live during Gemini and Apollo. I got robbed. And now I'm like, maybe we're getting all that back. Like we're getting it just a little later. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it like that at all, but it's so true. That is cool. This is such a cool story. I, I love the fact that Jared is is chosen a crew of people that helped him out on that first mission and given them an opportunity to go to space. I love that. I don't know. The more I learn about this guy, the more I think he's great and I love what he's trying to do and he's the person we need right now. Yes. He's our Batman. Yeah, <laughs> but my, I'm just smiling like ear to ear right now because I'm just, I'm like uh, thinking about it. I'm like, that is so cool. Like I used to always think, oh, he missed out on all the cool stuff. And now I'm like, maybe we didn't, you know? Yeah. Maybe it just arrived a little later in our timeline. So that's really cool. Sure. And talking of cool stuff, and finally, the James Webb Space Telescope sent back its first photo. It's got a special lens within the near-infrared camera instrument, which allowed engineers to take a look at the mirror alignment and take what we would call here on Earth a selfie. Uh, It's a wonderful image, and it's great that we're continuing to see this incredible spacecraft operate so well. It's a cool story. Very cool. So that's it for this week. Something a little different, which perhaps hasn't seen much attention elsewhere. But we hope you found it interesting. And we certainly found it really interesting. I thought that was really cool. Me too. If you did, please do consider hitting that share button for us or leaving us a review. All of that massively helps us reach new people. And our marketing uh, budget is still very much zero. So please... Hit that share button. (laughs) Yeah, we really appreciate all your help that you're willing to give to us. Uh, So until next week, don't forget, in space, no one can hear you stream. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.